Okay, hello everyone. My name is James Larish, and as Christina said, I'm from Northeastern University. I'll be presenting a joint work done by Northeastern University, the University of Maryland, and Duke University. So I'm going to be talking about TLS revocation. TLS revocation is a problem that many people have tried to solve over the years, and I'm, going, I'm here to present one more solution, but I promise this time it's different. So before I talk about that, uh, I'm going to go into a brief history of TLS revocation. So the browser requests, uh, makes a TLS request to a website, and in response, the website uh, sends back its TLS certificate, which, is sign which, includes, which includes its public key and is signed by a certificate authority. Now, the browser trusts the certificate authority, so the browser can trust that they are talking to the real owners of the website. But let's say the website is hacked and the private key for the certificate is compromised. So the website goes to the, the issuing certificate authority and says, please revoke my certificate. And the certificate authority does so. Uh, but how do browsers get access to this information? So the first mechanism for doing so is called certificate revocation lists. Basically, prior to completing the TLS handshake, the browser asks the issuing certificate authority for a list of all of their revoked certificates. And the certificate authority responds with this list. The browser checks to see if the website certificate is on the list, and if so, it blocks access. But making a CRL request for every TLS handshake is untenable, because uh, Apple, for example, has a 76 megabyte CRL. So rather than asking for all the revocations and then checking, uh, oh yes, uh, the browser can simply ask the certificate authority if the given website certificate is revoked. And that's exactly the idea behind Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. The browser says, is this website certificate revoked? The certificate authority responds with a signed response, and the browser acts accordingly. But OCSP introduces a constant latency penalty. Uh, not to mention, the certificate authority now knows that the browser has visited the given website. So the current revocation mechanisms are unpopular and inferior. Browsers especially don't like these revocation mechanisms. As of 2015, Internet Explorer was the only browser to implement full CRL and OCSP checking. On the other hand, mobile browsers completely eschew revocation checking due to the, uh, the latency and bandwidth performance penalties. A better solution was proposed. Rather than the browser making the OCSP request, the website can. Prior to serving the certificate, the website asks the certificate authority, is my certificate revoked? The certificate authority responds and staples this response to the, the certificate, hence the name OCSP stapling. There are two problems with this. Number one, an attacker with access to the network can strip the OCSP response from the certificate. And uh, uh, as of 2016, only about 7% of all certificates were served by an OCSP stapling supporting server. So let's take, take a step back and examine what we would like out of a revocation system. Obviously, we want clients to have access to all revoked certificates in the TLS space. Currently, if an attacker blocks the OCSP or CRL response, a browser assumes the best and allows the user through. We would like our system to adopt a fail close security posture rather than this fail open. Browsers shouldn't have to sacrifice efficiency for security, and they also shouldn't have to sacrifice their privacy. In addition, our ideal system would be auditable, auditable meaning third parties could verify the integrity of the revocation information being dispersed. And finally, the solution should be easily or at least incrementally deployable. It shouldn't require all website administrators or all certificate authorities to agree upon a standard and implement them simultaneously. So to review, existing revocation mechanisms are inferior and unpopular. So browsers, in response, have come up with their own revocation mechanisms. Chrome, for example, maintains CRL set, which contains 15,000 high priority revocations. Mozilla does the same thing with one CRL containing 400 revocations. Now, these systems are not designed to be complete, and they are nowhere near so. They are also, also not auditable. More ambitious solutions to the revocation problem have been proposed. 
Google has proposed revocation transparency, similar to their certificate transparency project in which certificate authorities append the, certificate, the revocation status of their certificates to an append-only log. Unfortunately, revocation transparency is not much more than a plan right now, and they haven't actually addressed the dissemination problem. RevCast, a project proposed by the University of Maryland, plans to uh, disseminate revocation information using FM radio broadcast systems. But this obviously requires significant hardware updates to home network devices. So we introduce CRL Lite, which ships the revocation status of all TLS certificates to all clients. Because clients have access to all the revocation information locally, and as long as they have access to our daily updates, they can adopt a fail close security posture. And since they're performing the checks locally, we get privacy for free. Now what about the hard stuff? If Apple takes 76 megabytes to send only their revocations to clients, how can we expect, how can we be expected to send all of our revocations to clients efficiently? What I'm going to show is that we send all the revocations using only 10 megabytes initially with a daily update of 580 kilobytes on average. I'll also show that our system is auditable and easily deployable. But let's get back to efficiency. So we need to send an we need to send a set of uh, certificate identifiers efficiently, and Bloom filters are a fantastic data structure for sending this type of data. They're incredibly space efficient. They're implemented with bit arrays. So what if we sent all revocations, we inserted all revocations into a Bloom filter, which we shipped to clients? And that's exactly what we tried. So for example, let's say DuckDuckGo certificate is revoked, and let's say K, the number of hash functions, is two. So inserting DuckDuckGo certificate means flipping two bits in the, Bloom, the revoked Bloom filter from zero to one. And now we'll say that ProtonMail certificate is also revoked, so we do the same thing. We flip two more bits from zero to one, and we ship this revocation filter to the clients. Now, the client encounters DuckDuckGo certificate in the wild, and it checks to see if the bits that result from hashing the certificate are one, which they are. So the Bloom filter says, yes, DuckDuckGo has been inserted, and it is revoked. So the browser blocks access, and everything is good. Now let's say the browser encounters Yahoo certificate, which is not revoked. Unfortunately, the bit array indices that result from hashing Yahoo certificate are they collide with bits that have already been flipped. So the Bloom filter will incorrectly report that Yahoo certificate has been inserted, and the browser will block access to a non-revoked certificate. This is the problem with Bloom filters. You run into false positives, and this is unacceptable for something like revocation, because it means that the browser might block access to a totally legitimate site, maybe your bank account, when the certificate has done nothing wrong. And this is where most people who have tried Bloom filters for this kind of uh, problem have gotten stuck. <clears throat> but this is not a problem today. As of 2016, thanks to the momentous efforts of Google and their Certificate Transparency Project and scans performed by Rapid7 and the University of Michigan, we are able to obtain full TLS certificate revocation coverage. Google's Certificate Transparency Project alone houses 90% of all certificates, and they're expected to house 100% by the end of this year. So what does this mean? So back to our original solution, we, ins we have access to all the revocations that a user could ever see, all the revoked certificates that a user could ever see. And so we insert these revocations into a Bloom filter, like we just did. But we, of course, run into the false positive problem. But luckily, we have access to all of the non-revoked certificates that a user could ever encounter. And because of that, we can derive all of the false positives that a user could ever encounter. Now, we can ship this Bloom filter and this list of false positives or whitelist to clients, and when they check if a certificate is revoked, they check and see if it's in the Bloom filter. If it is, they check to see if it's in the whitelist. If it's in the whitelist, then it is not revoked. If it's not in the whitelist, it is revoked. But what's a really good data structure for sending lists of data, sets of data like this? How about a Bloom filter? So we run into the exact same problem here, right? But we know, again, all of the revocations that a user can ever encounter. So we check, we look those up in the non-revoked whitelist Bloom filter, and we derive all of the false positives. And then we do it again. So hopefully you can see where this is going. Since each Bloom filter is a fraction of the size of the previous Bloom filter, 
we will eventually hit a level that does not have any false positives. This data structure is called a filter cascade. So we ship this Bloom filter cascade to clients and they encounter a certificate. What do they do? First thing they do is they check the first uh, Bloom filter. Since uh, Bloom filters do not have false negatives, if the certificate is not in the first Bloom filter, then we know it is not revoked. If it is in the first Bloom filter, we check the second Bloom filter. If it's not in the second Bloom filter, we know that it was in the revoked Bloom filter but was not in the whitelist, so it is revoked. If it is in the second filter, we check the third filter, and this process continues until the last level. So we implemented it. As of January 2017, we have collected, uh, we have 200 million raw certificates collected from the three data sources I mentioned earlier. And we validate these certificates to produce 30 million valid certificates. And then we pull out all of the CRL and OCSP endpoints. We crawl them to, to get 13 million revoked certificates. We use these two sets to construct our daily filter cascade, which we ship to clients and contains 43 million, the revocation status of 43 million certificates. As I mentioned, uh, so our, our January 2017 filter cascade has 10 levels, and looking up a certificate in the filter cascade requires at most 20 hashes. Uh, using the cardinalities of the sets of non-revoked and revoked certificates, we can modulate the false positive rate of each Bloom filter in the filter cascade to try to achieve the lowest size possible for the filter cascade. Now, we did some clever things with that, and I encourage you to look at the paper for more details. But as of January 2017, our filter cascade is 10 megabytes total. Unfortunately, downloading 10 megabytes a day is almost just as ridiculous as downloading full CRLs for every TLS handshake, especially when we consider that CRL set is only 250 kilobytes and one CRL is only 34 kilobytes. Luckily, we don't have to ship the full filter cascade to clients every single day. We can ship a daily update which is constructed by taking yesterday's filter cascade and today's filter cascade and bitwise XORing each level. This, these diffs are shipped to clients and they then XOR these, these diffs to their yesterday's filter to produce today's filter. After compression, these diffs are on average 580 kilobytes, which means the user has to download 580 kilobytes on average per day. We think that this, uh, the space trade-offs here are reasonable considering that we have 100% revocation coverage compared to CRL set and one CRL, which have less than 1%. So uh, as a client, you must trust that we do not either omit to revoke certificates or include non-revoke certificates. So we produce a third artifact called an audit log which contains all of the valid certificates and all of the signed CRL and OCSP responses that we received from certificate authorities. Independent third parties can verify the integrity of the filter cascades that we create, and since the raw certificate information is also available, uh, verifiers can download this as well to reconstruct filters and uh, assert that we are doing the right thing. So, in conclusion, our goal was to create an effective uh, solution to the revocation problem. Sierra Lite covers all TLS revocations today, and it does not require uh, any, any behavior from certificate authorities, which I think is key. We can do all of this using information that the certificate authorities have already made public. Since certificate uh, browsers can, uh, hold this revocation locally, this revocation information locally, as long as they have access to our daily updates, they can maintain the fail close security posture. As I've shown, it's efficient. Our current Bloom filter cascade is 10 megabytes with a 580 kilobyte download per day. Revocation checking is done locally, so there's no privacy issue. And we produce an audit log so that verifiers can verify the integrity of whoever decides to aggregate and distribute CRL Lite. Now, we have a fully functioning CRL Lite backend pipeline and a prototype Firefox add-on. However, Firefox is deprecating the APIs that make this add-on possible. And so we hope that CRLite will, CRL Lite will inspire browser vendors to adopt a solution like this. Since they can provide full TLS re revocation coverage to clients without forcing certificate authorities to do anything else. 
Thank you very much, and I'll now take questions. Um, ben Fuller, UConn. Can you say a word about what happens when clients miss updates? Sure. So uh, essentially, it is possible for, if, if a client were to miss an update, then um, let's say, you know, let's say they miss a week of updates. Theoretically, they could diff the filter cascade that they currently have with the most recent filter cascade, and we could ship that diff to them. We could XOR those diffs, right, uh, those filter cascades right there, and ship that diff to them right away, if, if you meant uh, in terms of diffs. Hi, Steve Matsumoto, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, great talk. Um, you talk about having access to all of the certificates that you could possibly see using uh, different data sources. Um, given that the churn, in other words, the new certificates that you're going to see, given that that set is increasing um, at a much larger rate, does, does this level of diff, um, 580 uh, kilobytes per day, is, does that take into account that churn in certificates? And if not, do you have an estimate of what that scale would be? Yeah, so the diffs uh, take that into account. However, uh, since you're right, the number of the issuance rate is much higher than the revocation rate. And so periodically, we, we, there are times where we need to resize the filter. So um, that, and oftentimes uh, making a diff is not possible. So there, are, there might be times, multiple times during the year where we have to reissue a Sierra light. Thanks.